So, okay, we're going to start the session now. My sound is clear. Is my sound clear? Yes, yes, it's clear. Okay, great. So we have this 53-year-old lady with a history of AVR and TV repair presented with compressive chest pain. Initial workup revealed ST depression across the precordial leads and modest elevation of troponin. I think it was 0 0.2, 0 0.1, stuff like that. Echo was done one hour later. I'm going to show you the videos. Which of the following echo feature is most consistent with the diagnosis of stress-induced cardiomyopathy? Now, this is uh, the initial video. What do you see here? So this is the metallic mitral valve, right? This is the metallic mitral valve here. Okay. Sorry. Metallic mitral valve. And I think also the, the well, what do you think about the tricuspid valve? Repaired. No, I, I, I think it's not repaired. Look again, look again at it. Okay. It's bioprocesses, you see? It's okay. bio replacement, yeah. So it's bioprocesses in the tricuspid, metallic processes in the mitral. And we see that there is aneurysmal apex, right? And this aneurysm is start from the mid cavity all the way to the true epic. So we just have the basal segments which are spared. Okay. So it looks like the Kutsubu. So now the question is, which of the following echo feature is most consistent with the diagnosis of stress-induced cardiomyopathy? The multi-territorial segmental involvement. And by that, we mean, uh, if you look here, you will find that. And we, if we look at the second video as well, as well, see that there are uh, the involvement is not corresponding to a single LAD, uh, I mean, uh, coronary artery territory. So we are having, this is part of the lateral wall, which is supplied by the CERC. Uh, this is part of the inferior septum, which is supplied by RCA. And this is the true apex, which is supplied by LAD. So now we have multi-territorial, huh? multi-territorial. And in acute coronary syndrome setting, we expect to find a single territorial problem, okay? Once we see this multi-territorial, we start to think of stress-induced cardiomyopathy. So that's not, I think this is one of the, features of stress-induced cardiomyopathy, multi-territorial segmental involvement. Number two, RV apical hypokinesis, akinesis. Again, I'm going to show you here. Look at the RV free wall. This is the RV free wall. At the base, it is contracting. When you start to go at the apex, the contractility decreases. Maybe you see it even here better. Now we are here toward the apex and look at the RV toward the apex. So RV epic, apex is severely hypokinetic here. Does that mean anything? Let's find out. The gradual recovery of LV dysfunction within few days to few weeks, if this is a feature of stress-induced cardiomyopathy? Yes, it is. You agree? Hello? Yes. Hi. Okay. Yes. So you agree that the gradual recovery of LV dysfunction within few days to few weeks is a feature of stress-induced cardiomyopathy? Yes, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that, and then the discrepancy between the level of troponin and the extent of LV dysfunction. Do you think this is a feature of uh, yes. stress-induced? Yes. Yeah. And by the discrepancy, we mean when you do echo, you will find that the echo is multi-territorial. Many segments are involved. The ejection fraction is very low, but the troponin is just 0 0.1, 0 0.2. You know, yes. it's not corresponding or it's not matching the amount of damage you see by echo. And the epical ballooning, again, is a feature. So actually, these five uh, features are consistent with the diagnosis of stress-induced cardiomyopathy. But the question is asking, which of the following is most consistent? So which one you are going to choose? B. E. 
Any other opinion? E. E. Epical balloonic. Epical balloonic. Okay. Okay. Cool. By the way, Annie, and I, I, I apologize for this MCQs because actually we have chosen this MCQs for echo board. That's why it's a bit tough. The right, the right answer what here is C. Is, is C? B. It's B. Gradual recovery? No, it's B. The RV epical hypokinesis and akinesis. Well, the least yeah, it's, know. yeah, it's so it's so un, un, unexpected, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's so unexpected. Yes. Yeah, see, the multi-territorial segmental involvement is a feature. Gradual recovery is a feature. Discrepancy, feature. Epical ballooning is a feature. Like in the most consistent is RV epical hypokinesis. To what extent? To the extent that when you see it, you might even stop sending this patient to cat lab. You know, this one here, this part of the RV, when it goes hypokinetic, Compared to the basal wall, this is very, very specific of Takotsubi, stress-induced cardiomyopathy. But the problem is you might fail to elicit it. But if you elicit that, you are almost having a diagnostic certainty of stress-induced cardiomyopathy amounting to 98%. 98%. Okay? Good. So remember all these features. Lacking, Anna, I want you to remember an important question or an important point. Stress induced cardiomyopathy is the diagnosis by retrospect, meaning there is no way so far you can confidently diagnose stress induced cardiomyopathy before you exclude coronary artery disease. And even according to the recommendation, don't rely on any features, any features, okay, to suppress the air to take this patient to cath lab because it's better to err on the side of caution. So once you see a patient coming with chest pain, troponin, ACG, and that echo, the safest option is to take this patient to the cath lab, okay? The safest option is to take the patient to cat lab. Yes. Even if you have a suspicion and you have doubt based on clinical and history data that this is most likely to Tsubo, you cannot dismiss taking patient to cat lab. Yani, this lady is my patient. She came after visiting her her, her sister who was a case of terminal cancer and it was like goodbye visit because they are gonna kind of pull the plug and she came with chest pain and we did the echo and we found these findings okay and we elected to take her to cath lab okay but the thing is the same day of her admission there was a problem. There was a big, a bit of crowd in the cath lab. So we couldn't uh, do it the same day. We did, uh, we did it the next day. I was suspecting the Kutsubu from the start because of the emotional stress the patient was through and stuff like that and the acuity of our problem. And then um, I said to myself, let me do echo just, uh, just for fun, you know, echo next morning. We did echo the day before. And I decided to do echo next morning. When I did echo next morning, the ejection fraction was almost back to normal. It was from this, the images, and I didn't bring that one, but there was a dramatic improvement in her LV function. Okay? But, but sometimes the, the so-called gradual recovery within few days to few weeks, sometimes takes few days. Few days and you will see robust uh, recovery in the LV function. Okay, so you always have to remember the stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Now, we have this 57-year-old lady referred for echo as part of workup for kidney transplant. 
As to the effect and cause of her renal failure, after reviewing the videos of her echo, which of the following is true? I'm gonna show you the videos. This is the first video, and this is the second video. Okay. Now, back to the question. She is uremic as evidenced by the precardial effusion. Her echo portrays a picture of hypertensive heart disease. Her renal failure may well be due to polycystic kidney disease. This renal failure induced exuberant degeneration on the mitral valve. It's a picture of amyloid heart and probably renal disease. So I'm gonna take you back to the videos. We are seeing some glistening texture, maybe LVH, small precardial effusion, normal LV systolic function, mild thickening of the mitral and, 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 and aortic valve. And here again, we see the small precardial effusion, but we are seeing something here, right? What is this? Any guess? What could that, what be? Could that be? Plural effusion. Plural, plural. Uh, plural, uh, plural effusion. effusion. Uh, the plural effusion is not going to have all these kind of septation. These are cysts. You know, they are cysts here, you see. Okay. okay. So what could that so be? So what could that be? Due to a cyst in the lung? A uh, cyst in, 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 yeah, 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 uh-huh. I hear in the background the uh, right uh, answer. Right answer. Uh, sorry? So uh, sorry? there is a cyst in the lung the associated lung with the polycystic kidney uh, disease. Uh, cyst, uh, uh, yes, you are right. But these are yeah. cysts yeah. where? Uh, yes, where? you are right. Yeah. But these are cysts where? Where? In the liver. In the liver, in exactly. The liver. Exactly. Yes. Exactly, you're so right. Exactly, you're so right. So, so this is the... This is the... Liver cyst. Liver cyst. Uh, yes, there is a problem with the sound. I'm, I'm, I'm going to check, check it just a moment. Just a moment. Hello? 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 Yes, 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 يبقى معناته هنا let's go back here she is uremic as evidenced by precardial effusion not necessarily yes precardial effusion is part of manifestation of uremia but not necessarily you can have a patient of renal uh, failure on dialysis they can have precardial effusion just for so many reasons uh, the echo portrays a picture of hypertensive heart disease not necessarily as well and uh, her renal failure may well be due to polycystic kidney disease. Yes, because we are seeing polycystic liver. So her renal failure might be due to polycystic kidney disease. The renal failure induced degeneration of mitral valve. As far as we see, the mitral valve is not so severely degenerative. And the last one, it's a picture of amyloid. No, it's not. It's not a picture of amyloid necessarily. Okay, so... The, the, the best answer here is this one, because we are, because seeing, we are that, seeing that this liver, this liver polycystic, polycystic liver, liver, that's why we, that's have, why chosen we have chosen C. Okay. Good. Sorry, again. Come again. It's okay. Okay, it's okay? Yes. Okay. Now, what is the most important piece of history you would like to inquire about in this patient? I'm going to show you the patient. You see? And look here. This is what? Tricuspid valve. 
and here is the severe tricuspid regurgitation. So let's go back to the push. History of rheumatic fever, history of coronary angiogram, history of trauma, history of renal failure, history of systematic or systemic disease. So back to the echo. What does this echo show? It's a bit tough, but let's focus more on the tricuspid valve. Focus more. What do you see? The tip of the valve is second. Uh huh. Collapsed. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, yes you are so right. right. Yes, you are so right. Yes. This is prolapsing, is prolapsing and, and, and probably, and this, probably is this is the anterior, anterior leaflet. Anterior leaflet. So, and this, and even, this the even the TR tends, tends to be tends more of more eccentric of... going the other direction, right? So now if we go back to the question, what piece of history would you like to inquire about in this patient? Uh huh. History about trauma. Exactly. You are so right. History of trauma. So this is important about tricuspid valve. By the way, tricuspid valve, we have a problem of premature closure uh, bias because we are so accustomed to seeing functional tricuspid regurgitation. So we miss organic tricuspid disease. Okay. So, uh, so you get my point I'm, I, I was saying that the vast majority of mitral valve disease is functional right right yeah right? yes. yes yes and that's why you know sometimes you scroll so fast whenever you see the tricuspid valve you don't bother about looking so attentively to the tricuspid valve assuming that it is going to be functional and that's why you can miss organic organic tricuspid valve disease like in this patient was reported by the first echocardiographer as functional but when we focused more we found that this patient is having prolapse Okay, or flail actually. Great, type. let's go to this question. And uh, 30 year old lady with mitral valve prosthesis in 2012, presented with shortness of press class three and was four months pregnant. Reviewing her echo provided, what's your interpretation as to the etiology and severity of mitral regurgitation? Now, this is a zoom in TE, Taban. This is TE. And as you see, there is a problem here. Can anybody describe what is he, she, see? What's going on here? Uh huh. What's going on here? Hello. And sometimes there I is a mass uh, attached uh, to the tip of the leaflet. Okay, yes, that there is a mass, yeah. But what is this mass? Look could at be a this thrombus or vegetation. Could be a thrombus or vegetation, or could be what? Uh, if 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 you look here at this valve, what is it? This is bioprocesses. You see the struts here? Yes. Yes. So it is bioprocesses. If it's bioprocesses, then we have to forget about caudal rupture because caudal rupture is a native valve disease. So uh, uh, we have to think of something different now. We have a cusp that is flail, flail, you see? And yes. we are seeing part of it here. So this is torn. So this is torn. The cusp is torn. Okay. And this is one of the manifestations of degeneration, by the way. Yani de degeneration can come in different shapes and morphologies, one of which is the tear leaflet. So we're going to choose this one, C, severe mitral regurgitation due to torn leaflet. Okay, good. Which of the following is true? Uh, yani, uh, my message here, by the way, when we are talking about degeneration of the valve, 
don't just look at the calcification and thickening of the valve. Sometimes the degeneration is manifested as tear in the cusp, perforation in the cusp, and stuff like that, okay? So there are different uh, morphologies of degeneration. Now, which of the following is true about cardiac physiology and pathophysiology? This is the type of the hardest question. When things, and going back to basics is always really hard. I don't know why. <laughs> like in, although the basics should always be our launching always. grounds, like in the diamond, the asylum, short and non clinical questions is really tough. Uh, type. Now, the diastolic function is a passive energy independent process. The atrial remodeling in atrial fibrillation leads to uniform dilatation in the three dimensions. In the basal myocardium resides the densest adrenergic receptors. The radial motion of the myocardium is the only motion responsible for the ejection. And the function of the aortic trileaflet relies, among other factors, on the aortic root recoils and dynamics. So, uh, maybe let's go one by one. The diastolic function is a passive process. It's a passive process. No, it is active process, no, actually. Active. Great, great. It's an active process, active process. Energy dependent, not energy independent. Good pendant, good B. The atrial remodeling in atrial fibrillation leads to uniform dilatation in the three dimensions. No. Uh-huh. Uh, mainly in the transverse dimension more than the vertical dimension. Okay, very good, very good. So can you explain further? You're right, but can you explain it further? So we can all understand. And if I mean, I the, 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 is the, the stretching of the, uh, of the fiber in the transverse dimension will be affected more than the apical one or uh, more than the vertical one. Uh-huh. The atria direct, okay. Type, if I take you, maybe that's gonna help you in the explanation. If I take you to the prostenal long axis, this is how we see the heart in the prostenal long axis. The mitral, the aorta, the LV, and part of the RV here, right? So this is, the left atrium is here. What is here? Structure is the sternum. What is here? The spine, right? Right? The spinal cord, and I mean the spine, uh, the vertebral column. So uh, the heart is constricted or uh, the heart is bounded anteriorly and po posteriorly by bony structure, right? But what about lateral and medial? It's free to expand. That's why the left atrium, when it dilates, it dilates more in the longitudinal than the vertical axis. Because in the vertical axis, this dilatation is limited by these two bony structure. Therefore, it dilates more horizontally. So the dilatation, what you see in the epical five, and uh, sorry, I mean epical uh, four here. This is what? This dilatation is longitudinal. And that's why taking the measurement of the left atrium here, just a single dimension from the parasternal long axis might not be truly representative of the actual size and volume of the left atrium. That's why the recommendation is to go for volume assessment. And volume assessment is a true three-dimension image of the left atrium. That's why a single dimension, especially from the prostenal long axis, might not be 
truly reflecting the actuality of the size of the left atrium. Okay, so this one is wrong. And we said this one is wrong. So now we come here to the basal myocardium res resides the densest adrenergic receptors. So there is adrenergic receptors all over the myocardium. They are densest in the basal myocardium as compared to the apex. Do you agree or disagree? Disagree. 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 Uh, sorry, I lost your voice. You said densest in the adrenergic receptor in the epic of the tapatosu. I think. Oh, thank you so much. This is a great kind of analytical integration. You are so right. Yani white kutsubu has a predilection to the uh, to the to the apex. One um, causes ballooning of the apex is because it is uh, emotional and physical stress, and there is adrenergic uh, surge. And this adrenergic surge is gonna stress the heart. It stress the heart because there is receptors everywhere in the myocardium, but they are mostly in the apex. That's why the apex is affected more by stress. So that's a great, great, great analysis and a smart one. Even if you don't know, you can guess. So this is wrong. So the right answer is that the apex has dense adrenergic receptors as compared to the base of the heart. Now, the radial motion of the myocardium is the only motion responsible for the ejection. I Here think this is right. Uh -huh. no. Right or wrong? Wrong because not the only motion responsible. Uh -huh. So the what else? The, what the else? other motion is the uh, um, is the, uh, the elastic uh, the elastic recoil is affecting the, the diastolic function merely. Ah yes, the elastic recoil is the relaxation. Ejection. But the ejection, yeah. but the ejection. Mm, we have to the the ejection is more with the with the uh, radial uh, and twisting uh, uh, mechanism. mechanism. Very good, very good, very good. And that brings us to the idea of cardiac mechanics. We initially, our NASCAN initially, they think that the heart is just contracting inward and outward, inward, just like that. And this is the radial motion of the heart, the inward. But they found out, no, there is circumferential, there is horizontal, horizontal meaning if this is the epical four, the heart is contracting horizontally. So these segments are going to all these segments. And there is also twisting and untwisting uh, of the apex and the basal segments. So it's complicated kind of dynamics. The motion, the, the radial motion is just one of many others. Okay, so we have to cross this one out. Now we are left with this. So the function of the aortic trilateral right. relies. Yeah, this is the right answer. Though this right answer is just made by exclusion because by itself does not make sense to you, right? And if you read it just like that, you are going to be, um, you know, taken aback. How come? How come the function of the aortic trileaflet relies, among other factors, on the aortic root recoils and dynamics? And this is, by the way, is physiological fact that the trileaflet, the the trileaflet, the dynamicity, our dynamics, حقاتها تعتمد على الأورتيك روت. ولذلك there are so many times you see a patient is having mild moderate aortic regurgitation, and all he has is a dilated aortic root or a stiff aortic root. The leaflet themselves are fine and pliable and soft and no much of degeneration to explain this aortic regurgitation. The problem is in the root. So the root has a lot to do with the functionality of the aortic valve. Okay? Good. Now, what 
other features in echo for this patient you will be on the lookout for. So you first have to see this signal, interpret this signal, put a diagnosis in your mind, and look for additional data to support your diagnosis. So what are you seeing here? There is respiratory variation in the... Okay, very oh. good. Mm -hmm. uh, if, where is inspiration? This is, wh when it goes up, this is inspiration. When it goes down, this is expiration. So expiration and inspiration. So now we are having respirophasic variation. It's going low in inspiration and it's going high in expiration. So this increase expiratory flow reversal. Increase expiratory flow reversal. So what does that mean? In hepatic venous Doppler. Increase. That means there is a septal bouncing. Okay, so we are talking about constriction. Thank you so yeah. much. So when you are talking about constriction, go and look for the septum. Septal bounce. Okay, great. So far, so good. Great, you are doing so fine. Now, ECG, who can read this ECG for us? Sorry, it's blared a little bit, but try your best. Uh -huh. Sinus, exactly. About 65. Okay. Yeah. The axis, the left axis, the normal uh, axis. Uh -huh. There is dominant yeah. R wave in V1. Oh, great. Okay. So, what are the causes of dominant R in V1? Causes of dominant R in V1. Uh, RVH, posterior RVH, infection. very good. Two. Posterior infection. Posterior MI, very good. Three. And dextrocardia. Dextrocardia, great. Four. Um, Wolf Parkinson Watson. WPW, great. Five. Or six, one, two, three, four, five. Juvenile pattern. Young yes, juvenile, as yes. juvenile, they have a dominant R. And last, yes. last is lead reversal. Lead, lead, yes. And this is actually lead reversal. This ECG. Between it and between, between, between the lead reversal is between which and which? B1 and B3. Yes, salam alaik. Thank you so much. How do you know that? Okay, the transition started in V2, then uh, get negative in V3. So How happy. are you positive that this V3 should be in V1 and V1 in V3? Because of negative B wave. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you see here this P is inverted, is negative polarity. So this belongs here actually, and this belongs here. So if you just put this one back and this one back, the precordial progression is back to normal, okay? So remember lead reversal has so many, you know, ways, okay? Yeah, now we used to do the exam sometimes, we, uh, 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 yeah, we, we, we made our own ECG and we do so many amazing reversal, you know, just to make grill the student or the, the fellows in their exam. But, yeah, this is one of the things which is not really yeah, easy to, to, to pick up. So remember lead reversal is one of the differential diagnosis of dominant R in V1. Great. Next, what is this? Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, 
Uh huh. Anybody? Hi, Nasrif. Okay. Uh, I think it is two to one hard block progressive prolongation of BR. There is a uh, uh, Okay. There is a strip. Yeah. Okay, good. Don't you see this one? Uh, does that mean anything to you? This lead and this lead, maybe. Q waves, huh? And Q wave inversion. Yeah, wave so this is, yeah, this is a bit late, uh, inferior MI. And and part of it with inferior MI, we usually have reflex. I mean, we all we should always develop this kind of uh, reflex. Once you see inferior MI, look for posterior extension and look for blocks. Okay. Yeah. So posterior extension and blocks. Do we have blocks here? Yes, we do. Yes. Look at the PR. It's getting. Progressively then bigger drops. and then drop. So this is mob style oh. one. Okay, wave inferior wall MI. Great. What is this ECG? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, there is. Uh... Uh, neurocomplex tachycardia sinus oh. reason. Okay. Uh, there is a uh, diffuse sudden shape ST segment uh, elevation. Very good. Uh, with uh, uh, BR uh, segment is elevated in uh, ABR and depressed in the leg two. This most probably pulmonary embolism. Or, or, or. Yeah. Or pericarditis. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Actually, you have described all the ECG features of pericarditis. The this uh, kind of pericarditis. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know you mean <laughs> the convex or call it the concave ST segment elevation, the diffuse ST segment elevation, the uh, PR elevation in AVR, and the sagging of PR elsewhere. Uh, this is the most specific of pericarditis. The PR depression the PR depression uh, uh, or the sagging, okay? So this is typical ECG of pericarditis. Good. Now, what do we see here? Okay, this is uh, sinus risk. ECG. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. The red is, um, um, I think it is approximately 80. Okay. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, right, band, uh, right axis deviation. Okay. And uh, there is um, uh, inverted uh, wave. Okay. Uh, in the uh, starts from uh, V2 uh, up to uh, uh, high lateral lead. Okay. Uh, so this most probably subendocardial ischemia. Subendocardial ischemia. Okay. So you have to document it for uh, progression. Uh, there is a, uh, also there is positive. Uh, uh huh. Yes. R wave in ABR. Very good. So this uh, one here. Progression. Yeah. Exactly. What makes the uh, positive AVR, positive R and AVR. AVR, AVR, I don't know, there is, I just, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. AVR is a lead of negativity, right? Yes. AVR is the lead of negativity. So all the waves are negative. When we have a dominant R in AVR, that is so extraordinary. So what's going on here? Uh, we maybe have a lead it's reversal or, or uh, dextrocardia, right? Or now, dextrocardia. what are we dealing with here? Lead it's reversal or most probably? Yes, exactly, exactly. Now, no, look at the progression. The progression is all reversed. The progression from V1 to V6 tends to go from low to high in terms of R positive polarity. Now it's taking the reverse. So we have reversed 
precordial progression. And when we come to the AVR, AVR is positive and lead one is negative. So this is dextrocardia. We have also negative in lead one. Yes, exactly, exactly. So this is a dextrocardia ECG. Great. Now, what do we see here? Okay. Inferior STEMI. Uh, yes, uh, inferior STEMI. Exactly. We have inferior STEMI, ST segment elevation, and Q wave in the inferior leads. With ST segment for AVL. Oh, yes. Uh huh. What else do we have? Heart blocks. Block. With the uh, posterior yes. extension, ST segment depression in uh, V2 and uh, upright uh, T wave. In the case do we have it extension. here? Do we have it here? Um, uh, no, really, right? is yeah. positive. not really. Yes, yes, we have a block. Exactly. Two to one block. Uh, what is this block? What's uh, ca what can you precisely describe? How can you precisely describe the block? Between one to two block. One to two block. Yeah. Why, not Why not Mobis? Why not Mobis? Winky bar. Yeah, Mobis type one. Look here. This is, look, uh, 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 follow, follow me down here in lead to the rhythm strip. PR, now PR is getting bigger, now more, now drop. Now we are starting again. Small, more, big, then drop. Then we are starting all over again. So this is Winky bar, okay? Mobis type one. Yeah, exactly, okay? Yes. Great. Now, what do we have here? This is one of the toughest ECG, by the way. I warn you. <laughs> Brady, there is bradycardia with a yes. T wave. Okay. Okay. It looks like the dioxin toxicity. Mm, not necessarily. Or hyperkalemia or hyperkalemia. Okay, because of the uh, the the the, the, the okay. wave. I think this is uh, Mobis okay. type two. There is the B wave embedded in the T wave, giving this uh, upright uh, high uh, T wave. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, very good. Very two good. To one. Very good. So. Here, the, 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 the morphology of the T wave is a little bit bizarre. It doesn't look like the hyperacute of ischemia, not of hyperkalemia, because you see here, it's kind of, it goes so constricted up like this. It looks like this. So this is the T wave in, into which imposed a P wave. It looks like this. So this is P wave here, actually. There is P wave here. So if we have P wave here, what does that mean? We have P. Uh, is it two to one block? Mm? Not yeah. necessarily. You know, it, what could it be? Like, if, if, if you take, take this one. P. Uh, let's, let's, let's march, march the P's out. Let's march them out. B, P, P. Now, we come here. Now. So the P's are not marching, are not marching, right? So that means this P is premature. This P comes prematurely. So what is the meaning of this? This is PAC in by Gemini blocked. So this is blocked P, P, PAC in by Gemini. Blocked BAC in by Gemini. So PAC is coming after each normal complex or after each normal P wave and it's blocked, it's not conducted. Okay, it's not conducted, right? So it's it's a tough ECG, right? Yes, yeah? yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm sure here. <laughs> but, so you mean it is a uh, SA no disease, not a uh, AV no disease? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Okay, now this is an easy one. Mm -hmm. 
What are we seeing here? Electrical alternators. Yeah, this is electrical or electrical alternators. And can you give me the differential diagnosis? Large pericardial infusion or cardiac tamponade. Large pericardial infusion. Or even severe LV dysfunction. لا سيفير إل في ديسفونشن إس بي تي إن آر تي إس بي تي أوكي إس بي إن آر تي طيب إل في ديسفونشن سيفير إل في ديسفونشن causes something that we always make a confusion with electrical alternance what is that pulse alternance so I used to say that over and over again. Pulse alternance is a clinical pulse sign and has nothing to do with ECG. Electrical alternance is an ECG sign and it has nothing to do with pulse. Okay? So remember this one. Now, electrical alternance is either due to large precardial effusion or tachycardias, like SVTs sometimes lead to also this beat, I mean, beat to beat variation in the amplitude. Okay? Now, all of the following are correctly matched except SLE and Lipman sac endocarditis, sarcoidosis and LV arrhythmia, carcinoid and isolated mitral valve fibrosis, rheumatoid arthritis and precardial effusion, ankylosing spondylitis and aortitis. Okay, let's see answer. Carcinoid, if we have ASD, just we can involve in the mitral valve fibrosis. Okay, great. So, carcinoid affect the right side more, Taman, for understandable reason, because it comes from the liver and, you know, serotonin. We are talking about serotonin, which is a fibrotic, and it induces fibrosis in the valve. So it affects the tricuspid and pulmonary valve, okay? And when the serotonin reach the, the lung, it get detoxified there. So the right, uh, the, the left side of the heart receive a clean blood. Unless, like the doctor said, you have an ASD that can shunt the serotonin loaded blood to the left side. Or if you have overwhelming serotoninemia, or if you have lung carcinoid. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay? Yes. So there are three, three circumstances where you can have uh, affection of the left side, either lung carcinoid or ASD or overwhelming kind of serotonin secretion. Good. Now, a young man with DCM, an ejection fraction of 25, presented with recurrent left-sided pleural effusion, which was deemed to be due to heart failure, though the effusion fails to recede on heart failure drug therapy. What is the correct answer given this clinical scenario? Left-sided pleural effusion is atypical of heart failure and a search for another cause should commence Plural, uh, plural effusion is due to heart failure, but should be tapped. Treating plural effusion in context of heart failure is futile. Pleurodesis is indicated. Surgical precardio pleural window is indicated. So A is the right answer. Yes, for A. A is the right answer. Okay. In, in case of heart failure, heart failure is associated most commonly with the right pleural effusion. With right pleural effusion. Okay. Yeah. Like, so you are, with you are going with? B. 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 Okay. Good. Uh, okay, so we all have some kind of, I don't know, classical teaching or uh, clinical observation that in heart failure, we are seeing more of right-sided pleural effusion than left-sided pleural effusion. But that's not true. 
the majority of patients of heart failure will have bilateral effusion. It might be more on right than left, but it's usually bilateral, okay? So the notion that the heart leads to right-sided pleural effusion preferentially, and that's left-sided pleural effusion exclude heart failure as a cause, that's big wrong, okay? That's not right. It's not right. لأنه يا أخوانا هي بالسimply what causes pleural effusion is the hydrostatic pressure, right? For once in like you have you have heart failure, the hydrostatic pressure is distributed equally in the two pleural space. That's why you have exudation uh, of fluid or transudation of fluid in both pleural cavities. ولكن ولكن having said that, we usually see left Domin uh, right dominant pleural effusion than left dominant pleural effusion. So if you observe enough, you will, you will find bilateral pleural effusion, but you are going to find more on the right side than the left side. Right? And why is that? Why is that? Because of the drainage, the venous drainage of the right, of the right lung. ممكن ممكن يكون relating to drainage. Yes, that's that's the that's the the, the most uh, accepted speculation in the patient of heart failure because of the cardiomegaly and because the heart is tilting leftward, so they don't feel comfortable on lying on their left side. So they prefer to lie on the right side more. And by gravity, that is gonna suck more fluid in the right pleura than the left pleura. Okay. So the mechanism of hydrostatic pressure is equally um, increased in both pleural cavity, but because the patient tends to lie more on his right side than on his left side, there is more right-sided pleural effusion than left-sided pleural effusion. But the most important here is that left-sided pleural effusion does not exclude heart failure as a cause, never at all, okay? So in this case, we are gonna choose B as the right answer, okay? Because, you know, sometimes if, if the patient is having pleural effusion, the response to diuretics is not so good. It's insisted fluid and stuff like that. And if it's contributing to the patient dyspnea, you better tap it. Great. Which of the following is true about B and P? B-type, natriuretic, peptide. It's an inflammatory marker, an acute phase reactant. It is released from the myocyte in response to stretch. It causes cardiac remodeling. It's higher in dyspnea of pulmonary disease than dyspnea of heart failure. Sacubitril decreases the level of endogenous PMP. A. A. Aha. Uh -huh. Any? No, no, because B. 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 Okay. So I'm going to cancel this one, B. C. Yes. B. Great. B, the right. B, the right answer. Do we all agree with that? Yes, B, it is really. Sometimes it doesn't uh, release from the myocyte. I think I will go with D, D answer. D? I think it's E because D is the two of D. Sacubitril increase. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sacubitril increase. Sacubitril increase. Indigenous. Not yes. decrease. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that not is why right. combined as well. Exactly. Well, Taban, of course, this is big wrong. Higher in this year, of course. And it causes cardiac remodeling. No, actually, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's proposed to be acting in reverse remodeling. So it retards the process of adverse remodeling and might reverse it. So this is wrong. So we are in between A and B or between A and B. Okay, it's B. so B, yes, exactly, it's B. In no, response to it. Yes, you might say not only from the myocyte because from the atrium, but we are talking about B and B, not A and B, and uh, A and B from the atria and stuff from LA, A and B. Yeah, it's from. It's but, yeah, from B and B is basically from the myocyte. Okay, okay. Hatta lo fi other sources of B and B secretion that will not make B wrong. Lana, it's released from the myocyte in response to stretch. That's the true statement. 
does not exclude in of other sources of BMP secretion, right? So that's right. So it's released from the myocyte in response to its stretch. Now, sacupitril, what is sacupitril? Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much, Niprilysin inhibitor. Niprilysin inhibitor, and the, uh, the 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 class, the class, the new class after Pradaim HF, the new class which is now class one indication in heart failure management, HFRF, is ARNI class. ARNI. Yes, yeah, ARNI. ARNI stands for angiotensin. Angiotensin. Uh huh. And you can see receptor, receptor blocker inhibitor. So in inhibitor here is that for yes, inhibitor for the angiotensin receptor and the niprilysin. So angiotensin receptor niprilysin inhibitor. Okay. So this is the ARNI class. And the only drug in this ARNI class so far is. Interesting. Which is sacupitril valsartan. Sacupitril valsartan. Sacupitril valsartan. Which comes in 50 milligram dosing in 100 and in 200. 200. Yes. You, 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 your, your aim will be to push your patient to this 200 milligram, because this is the dose on which the paradigm HF oh, is, uh, is studied to be of outcome. Not 100 yeah. and not 50, it is 200, yes. okay? So yes. if the patient tolerates, you have to escalate the dose to reach 200 BID. Now, niprilysin inhibitor results in reduced neurohormonal activation reduce vascular tone, reduce sodium retention, reduce cardiac hypertrophy, all of the above. All of the above. Exactly, all yes. of the above. Great. Now, what is this ECG? Oh no, we have seen this one. What is this ECG? Mm -hmm. uh, yani, again, again, the most, yeah, it is, it is sinus reading. Okay, great. And what else? What about the P wave here? Peak P wave. Peak. And what about right, the P wave the here? So we have right axis. We have, like you said, sinus tachycardia. Oh, sorry, sinus rhythm. Right axis deviation, right bundle branch block. Uh, yes. Okay, is it right bundle branch block? Yeah, it's if, 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 if you look here, there is dominant R in V1. Dominant R no, in V1. It's a B block. So yes. if you have dominant R in V1, Alatul recall the differential diagnosis we have discussed before. So, yes. Aha. Uh -huh. This muscle probably patient of uh, pulmonary stenosis. Okay. Okay. Pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism. Why you said pulmonary embolism? It's uh, B pulmonar and uh, it's slow, uh, to some extent why it's, it's go also with uh, uh, LA dilatation. Okay, P pulmonary, very good. So we have P pulmonary. And do we have a, a my, uh, P mitral? Yes. We have, so we have also A yes. mitral. Okay. By atrial dilatation. So we have by atrial dilatation. And we have right axis. And we have dominant R in V1. And look here, dominant S in V5 and 6. RVH. 
RVH exactly. This is typical for RVH. So we have RVH. So what can some all these features together in one clinical diagnosis? This uh, A mitral, uh, P pulmonal, RVH. Uh -huh. Maybe uh, mitral stenosis or yes. mm -hmm. MR, by the way. Even mm -hmm. mitral regurgitation. Yani mitral regur or mitral stenosis leading to left atrial dilatation, leading to pulmonary hypertension, leading to RVH. Okay? Yes. Yes, exactly. Great. Now, what is true about this signal? It is PW signal. It is from the LVOT. It is obtained by the pedof probe. It indicates mild aortic stenosis. It indicates bead to bead variation. Mitral stenosis. Sorry, aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis. Okay. Aortic stenosis. Good. Aortic stenosis. From suprasternal view. Suprasternal. Okay. Suprasternal. You see the mean gradient here is 42. 42. So this goes with severe, not mild. So this is wrong. Uh, do you think there is bit to bit variation? No, that's nothing. No. Now, this is bit of okay. from MVOT. Is it PW signal? No. no. It is CW signal. Yes. CW signal. So that's wrong. And it's not from the LVOT. Yeah. So it is obtained by the Bed of probe, that pencil probe, or the non-imaging probe. These are all the same, all names for the same uh, probe. Bed of non-imaging pencil probe. Okay. Non-imaging. أكتر حاجة بنعرف بها. Non-imaging. Why non-imaging? هو طبعاً small. طبعاً أكيد you have used it once or uh, sometimes in your uh, practice. Uh, it is uh, advised to use it looking for higher gradient across the aortic stenosis uh, to diagnose severe aortic uh, stenosis. Uh, you tilt the patient to the right side and you scan him on the right side. You can also put it suprasternally. Non-imaging, look here. Whenever you see CW and PW, up here you are going to see what? The view. The view, the, the 2D. The 2D view from which you get this one. But the non-imaging, you are not going to see that view. That's why it's called non-imaging. It doesn't bring any 2D. It just focus on the velocities. Okay? That's why it's non-imaging. Pair of probe. Okay. Now, this PW and CW, because it's, it's a source of confusion, and it is uh, frequently asked, about in the exam. So what is PW and what is CW? Uh, CW recording high velocities. Okay, high velocities. While the PW record uh, no velocity. No velocity. What else? And the PW focus on one Focused. This one is unfocused. Okay, so so this is really important. So C W stand for continuous wave Doppler. P is pulse wave Doppler. You really have to know exactly the physics of the two and the utility of each one. When we are switching to PW, we are pursuing low velocities. Low velocities means mitral inflow, tricuspid inflow, LVOT, okay? Hepatic Doppler, hepatic, venous Doppler, pulmonary, venous Doppler, okay? CW is hunting for high velocities, aortic velocity, valve velocity, 
uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure by TR velocity, TR velocity, MR velocity, high velocities. Okay? This is one different. The other thing is that PW and the high range range precision precision from precise means accurate location of the range while cw in the haga is range ambiguity ambiguity and it gets confused about the range yani if you switch pw and you get a velocity you will know this velocity is coming from a certain location, precise location. But if you switch to CW and you get high velocity, that velocity has range ambiguity. You will not know for sure from where this high velocity comes. It comes from anywhere along the interrogation path. يعني إذا أنت عامل PW كده ممكن يكون في أي مكان الـ high velocity دي ممكن تكون من هنا ممكن تكون من هنا ممكن من هنا ممكن من هنا range ambiguity لكن إذا if you are switching to PW على طول الـ velocity في sample volume uh, denoted by the two cross like equal sign معناته الـ high velocity is just coming from this place okay so this is important to know high velocities low velocities range precision range ambiguity Okay, good. خلاص كده يا اخوانا. اتفهم الدية؟ Yes, yes. تمام. Good. A 70-year-old female yeah. has shortness of breath. ECG showed left bundle. Echo revealed ejection fraction 35%. Severe functional MR. The patient has high frailty score. Non-surgical candidate. What is it true about this patient? Surgery for MR is indicated. It's reasonable to be elected for TER, uh, T-E-E-R. -E -E now you have to be familiar with this. It is transcutaneous edge-to-edge edge repair. Transcutaneous edge-to-edge repair. Transcutaneous edge-to-edge repair. repair. After TE suitability assessment, or should go for ICD-CRT prior to considering uh, percutaneous repair or should go for transcatheter edge to edge repair only after failure of medical therapy. Uh -huh. uh, should, should, should go for ICD CRT after, uh, after failure of medical therapy. After failure of medical therapy. Okay. No, after an oh, ICD CRT ICD project, CRT. considering here, it is safe. After ICD CRT, great. Type. You are all right, by the way. Walakin, if I bring you to the new guideline, here they are. Look here, 2017. When revascularization is not indicated and surgical risk is not low, a percutaneous edge to edge procedure may be considered. We are talking about severe secondary mitral regurgitation. In patient with severe secondary mitral regurg, when the ejection fraction is more than 30, when symptomatic despite optimal therapy, including CRT, and who have a suitable valve morphology by echo, avoiding futility. Now look at 2021 guidelines. Transcutaneous edge to edge repair should be considered in selected symptomatic patient, not eligible for surgery, and fulfilling criteria suggesting an increased chance of responding to therapy. Do they talk about optimal medical therapy here? No. Do they talk about ICD CRT? No. So, in the new guideline, they tilted more to early tricuspid edge to edge repair before exhausting the medical therapy and ICD CRT therapy. So in this case, it's reasonable this patient to be elected for tricuspid rigor after TE suitability assessment without completion of the optimal uh, medical therapy without CRT. Okay? You get the point? Uh, excuse me, sir. Mm -hmm. 
يس جو اهيد انا لخبطت لك راسك صح فعلا فعلا هي بتلخبط يس جو اهيد جو اهيد يا Uh, regarding the um, يعني the presence of uh, left bundle branch and reduced ejection fracture, this uh, indicates there is uh, the uh, there is no uh, good uh, synchronicity between the atrium and the ventricle, and this is the direct cause of the annular dilatation and the functional MR. Yeah, I agree so with you. So if I treat the patient uh, goodly medically and uh, I go to the CRTD or uh, CRTP. whatever, uh, so uh, we'll improve the uh, synchronicity and that will limit the, uh, the, the, uh, the severity of the functional MR without needing for tear. You are so right. My point? Uh, yes. Yes, and, uh, Ruha, and it's also it cannot lead to regression. It can fail to regress this MR. Yeah, yes, okay, sure. we can give the patient chance Uh, before go further for uh, other intervention without uh, managing the, uh, the exact problem. I we think so. Are you, yes, uh, agree. We, we manage a patient as whole. We don't need to test the MR. So any patient uh, selected for CRTD? But the guideline is uh, not... Put This the patient medic. is uh, symptomatic with the left bundle branch. We should know the exact Uh, duration of QRS to select if this patient is candidate for CRTD or not. Um, I think we should treat the exact problem before we go further to other uh, intervention. I agree with you. Here, uh, the new guidelines with 2021 can feel some part which are so يعني, revolutionary in some does ways. The guideline, does the guideline have upgraded this year before the CRTD? Yes, يعني the, yeah. the new guidelines Agreed. have have upgraded uh, mitral clip in the guidelines from fallback option to the front line. يعني الآن هنا this is 2021 guidelines. بتقول إنه transcutaneous edge to edge repair should be considered in symptomatic patient not eligible for surgery, fulfilling criteria suggesting increased chance of responding to mitral clip. So what are the condition? The patient is symptomatic. Uh, when symptomatic after optimal medical therapy? No, they did not mention that. Okay, symptomatic even before starting the therapy. The other thing is that a patient has to be high surgical risk. The third factor is that you do TE and you assess feasibility or suitability for clip and that was fine. So if you have that patient should be elected for transcutaneous edge to edge repair. Now in 2017, the situation was different. No, you have to exhaust medical therapy. You have to do the conventional therapies, including CRTD before considering CLIP. But in these guidelines, they are jumping to CLIP early on in the management, early on. And probably if you review the two trials, which are QAPT and MITRA France, you will know why they did that. Okay. okay, Fana, I refer you to Coapt and Mitra France. These are the two trials upon which these new guidelines are founded in no fee oh, no. great benefit in doing mitral clip early in terms of mortality. Okay. But he is going to be a little bit of a little يا هي هي مشكلة الجايدلاينز طبعا از دايناميك تارجت فكل سنة في حاجات بتحصل. Now uh, a 37 year old female with severe primary TR complains of intolerance to exercise. The RV is mildly dilated. The patient has no sign of peripheral congestion. What is the next step? Surgical TV repair ولا transcutaneous edge to edge repair follow up on medical therapy and consider surgery only after failure to medical therapy, follow up on medical therapy without any consideration for surgery. It's an A, surgical TV repair. Medical TV repair. Okay. Good. So 
let's go to the guidelines. Okay. 2017, not much of a difference between 2017 and 2021 uh, as to the primary tricuspid regurgitation, primary, TR. Surgery should be considered in asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic with severe isolated TR and progressive RV dilatation or deterioration of RV function. The condition that are put for TV surgery is progressive RV dilatation. And that means serial follow-up and you see there is progressive dilatation or RV systolic dysfunction. Now look at 2021. Surgery should be considered in asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic with isolated severe primary and RV dilatation, only RV dilatation, even if you find mild RV dilatation, not necessarily progressive, not necessarily RV systolic dysfunction. So again, they are lowering the bar for tricuspid regurgitation surgical intervention, okay? Again, they are lowering the bar. So here, this is a candidate for surgical TV repair. Now, TV this repair. is as to the primary tricuspid regurgitation. Now, what about the secondary? Secondary is, in 2017, previous left-sided surgery and left -sided. In the absence of left-sided valve dysfunction surgery should be considered in patients with severe TR who are, asymptom who are symptomatic and have progressive RV dilatation in the absence of severe RV or LV, systolic dysfunction and severe pulmonary hypertension. Now in 2021, they said surgery should be considered in patients with severe secondary tricuspid regurgitation with or without previous left-sided surgery who are symptomatic and have RV dilatation only, not necessarily RV dysfunction. In the absence of severe RV or LV dysfunction and severe pulmonary hypertension. So you have to have no severe RV dysfunction, no severe LV dysfunction, no severe pulmonary hypertension. Okay? Good. Yes. Great? That is it yeah. for today. I hope so much you know you get new ideas and points in this presentation. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, if you have any questions. Uh, regarding the assessment of the uh, RV systolic function. You are most welcome, most welcome. Uh -huh. Regarding the? The RV systolic function, how to okay. assess and uh, what would we do actually in the practice is the, uh, uh, we do TAPSI. And TAPSI. the TAPSI is mainly, uh, I think it's reflected the, the basal side. Yes. So how can I set the apex and the other uh, part of the RV? This is from? a very smart question actually. Uh, TAPSI, how TAPSI is going to reflect the entire RV function, though it is a single dimension analysis. And when yeah, we exactly. compare TAPSI to MAPSI, there is MAPSI, by the way, which we yeah. are never using. <laughs> we are never using, but we have MAPSI, which is mitral annular plane systolic excursion. This is yes. tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. Now, MAPSI is out of use for a reason, and TAPSI is in use for a reason. RV, that's the RV, and this is the LV. When we do interrogation of this part by TAPSI, we are actually focusing on only a single point. But the RV physiologically is different than the LV. In the vast majority of the condition affecting the RV, the RV goes weak globally and remains strong globally. And when you have RV dysfunction, the RV dysfunction most likely is global RV dysfunction. So what is happening here is happening equally and uniformly across the entire RV. 
That's why a single point reflects what's going on the entire RV. That is not true in the left side because the left side is segmented. There is segmentation in the left side. So the MAPSI might not reflect the true status of the remainder of the LV. That's why MAPSI is bad, but TAPSI is still good. Okay? So that's why. That's why. I, I, I wish that answers your question. Uh, okay, but uh, regarding the first question, we should assess the apical uh, hypokinesia in the right side uh, uh, to uh, say this is um, uh, in the first insecure, I think. Uh, and actually, the health of the first insecure day uh, regarding the canital uh, ejaba, uh, the RV apical hypokinesia. Yes, think. exactly. Now, how can I assess that uh, to see to, uh, at the you end are to say so right. this is yes. uh, RV apical hypokinesia? Very good, very good. And, and I think you are so right here. Um, um, I, I am going to re-emphasize on a point I have mentioned. In the majority of RV dysfunction, entities, RV goes weak globally, but there are few exceptions. What are the few exceptions? The few exceptions means part of the RV goes weak, the rest is not. So there is segmentation in the functionality of the RV. I remember only two. One is pulmonary embolism. Two is? Yes. Makuni sign, you mean. Takutsu. Pulmonary embolism leading to? Makuni sign, you are right. And Takutsu leading to? Reverse Makuni sign. Yes. Reversed. It's kind of reversed. In pulmonary embolism, the apex goes hyperkinetic, while the rest of the walls are hypokinetic. Yes. In Tokutsubo, the apex is hypokinetic, while the rest of the wall are normal contractions. So it's kind of the reverse. I think these are the only two conditions when the RV goes segmental. The rest of the condition always TAPSI is going to reflect what's going on. Only these two conditions I am aware of. I am aware of. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah. But the TAPSI is still, yes, if, if you exclude, uh, if, 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 you, if your echo, thank you so much. If your echo is not about pulmonary embolism or Takutsubu, TAPSI is fine. Don't worry. Uh-huh. Okay. okay? Yes. Okay, that's great. great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, Mr. Karhatim, sorry, yes. question. Sure. Uh, and um, in the measurement of the RB function, we use that to MRC. There, I hear one method like Kimpton before volume reduction can be used, and I was like, mm. uh, Simpson? Simpson of the like, RV? Like Simpson. Uh, ah, like Simpson. Volume reduction. Method. Uh, volume? Volume reduction method. Uh -huh. Yes. Like symptom. Yes, I agree. Now, I'll, I'll RV quantification is not as easy and is not as, um, um, yani, the LV because we focus a lot and because of easy geometry and stuff like that. There are some special ways which are accurate, but the LV is geometrically elusive. That's why we stuck in the measurement. But there is volumetric assessment. There is a 3D assessment. There is a strain assessment. There is area fractional change assessment. There is dimension assessment. Okay. There is vortex assessment. There are so many ways are still going on, some of which are already in practice, some of which are still in the pipelines. The most validated and the most practical and the most reproducible way of assessing RV function is TAPSI. TAPSI. Lakin, that does not exclude in you are still using so many other parameters. Lakin, not as validated, not as reproducible, not as 
يعني practical as steps okay ولكن ممكن ال ال landscape in the future is bound to change for sure okay thank you so much